Well, good morning and welcome to Community Bible Chapel again. So, um, thanks for inviting me into your home again this morning, uh, or whenever it is you're listening to us. And uh, um, uh, we're grateful for God's grace to us. So, uh, I'm just going to start by talking about camping. You know, I, I love to go camping. Um, I did it all through my lifetime, you know, outside in the woods, seeing God and His creation, uh, away from all the distractions of the world. Uh, um, and, I, and I always have to laugh when I, when I, once in a while, sometimes we, we uh, camp in a public campground uh, rather than out in the woods somewhere. And I get my little tent, my little pup tent set up, and, you know, we get our sleeping bags rolled out and we're ready to go. And then we, we leave that and we go explore the woods or the mountains or the, uh, I usually get a little fishing in or whatever, my, whatever we have going on. So uh, it's just a joy, enjoyable time. <coughs> um, and, but it always makes me laugh when I, I get all set up and everything, and then next to me um, pulls in this this uh, other family comes into camp, and uh, they don't have a little pup tent like I have. They have a, a motorhome that's about the size of my house, uh, and it has all the amenities. They get the, the the cable TV thing set up out there, and they get it all plugged in, their electricity and sewer and water. Um, they get it all up, and I, and I and I laugh at that because because we think about going camping out in the woods, and here's this couple or this family that comes in, and and as I watch them throughout the the weekend or whatever, they they never leave their campsite. They stay right there, uh, never really enjoying the great outdoors. Uh, basically, uh, um, going camping and seeing a new place, but never leaving the old setting that they came from. Um, now, I'm not picking on RV campers. Uh, you guys are great. And so uh, go out and enjoy the, enjoy the world as God has created it. But I do want to see a, a spiritual reality that kind of comes from this. So many times uh, um, people come to Christ where all things become new, and yet they continue to live as if nothing is different at all. And so that's what I want to talk a little bit about today in this, as we think about uh, uh, all things new. Now, we've been studying spiritual warfare in the book of Ephesians, and our enemies are spelled out throughout the Bible as well, and listed here in this passage we're going to look at actually today, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Um, uh, and we have to be alert. We have to be fighting in all three of those fronts uh, each day and all day long. And we fight with the normal disciplines of our faith, prayer, study of God's word, application, uh, uh, service, anyway, all those things that fit into that. And the battle is always defined on, on, in three areas. It's a moral choice that we have to make um, uh, on a daily basis, so it's moral. It's also about worship, okay, who we'll choose to worship in the midst of those choices. Um, and it's also discipleship oriented, how we will battle together as God's body, how will we come alongside of one another as we fight uh, um, uh, uh, to live as a follower of Jesus Christ. Now, today I invite you to join me in, in Ephesians chapter 2 as Paul expands the discussion from really the third blessing that we looked at in, in chapter 1, the first week, um, which is really the, 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 uh, our redemption through the blood of Christ and what that redemption really is. And that's, that's really the crux of all things new. Now, if you're watching along on version. Uh, or if you have version, um, you can go to the events section in the bottom right-hand corner. I think that's where it is anyway. Um, and if you're not from Cooperstown area, you can type in Cooperstown, CBC Community Bible Chapel, Cooperstown, New York, and you'll find it listed there. Um, in fact, it's the only one listed there, and you'll be able to click on it and follow along with the, the notes that are on the, uh, on the version. Um, you know, this passage comes right on the heels of Paul's battle prayer for the Ephesians church. And he moves then to further explore all things new and what that means for us as we live our lives for Christ. So let's read that passage uh, this morning or today, whenever it is you're watching, <coughs> and uh, see what Paul has for us here. Chapter 2, Ephesians. Uh, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world, and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us lived among those at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But, verse 4, but... 
Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that the coming ages he might show us his incomparable grace of his uh, uh, incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. It is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Now, we're going to think about this uh, in a few ways. We're going to start out with, uh, as Paul does in the passage, verses 1 to 3, looking at the nature of sin and the result of sin. Uh, He begins the discussion kind of thinking about uh, uh, forgiveness by helping us to understand where we came from, helping us to understand the sin and where that left us. He talks about, in verse 1, being dead in sin. In Romans 6, 23, it tells us the wages of sin is death. And so uh, uh, physical part of that certainly is, is a piece of it, but he's really focusing in on spiritual death, that separation from God uh, uh, because of our sin. And so in our sin, before we trusted in Jesus, we were dead to all things spiritual. Uh, we were separated from God, had no desire to please him, no desire or no ability to, to make our way to him. And don't make a mistake for being sick and being dead. They're two different things. Matter of fact, very different things. When you're sick, you can either nurse yourself back to health or go to see the doctor and, and hopefully be healed. Um, but those things can't help someone who is dead. When they're dead, they're dead. Uh, and so we're dead, and we're in need of not just healing, we're in need of resurrection power uh, that only comes through Christ. So we're dead in sin. And secondly, we're disobedient in sin, as Paul mentions in verse 2. Before Christ, we could do nothing right because we were dead. We were, we were following our own desires spiritually. Right from Genesis 3, we see the moral choice to obey God or to follow my own desires. Adam and Eve made the choice to follow their own desires. We follow along in that same pattern as well. And so just like Adam chose to disobey, we do the same. So our culture tells us that that people are basically good, and so you don't need God's forgiveness. Or they try to make it uh, a degree thing, and so if if I'm not as bad as Hitler or somebody else that's really bad, then I'm going to be okay. Uh, God will be okay with that. Uh, And and I'll tell you right now, that's all fake news in the culture of today. That's the term that we use. It's fake news. And the fake news has has dramatic effects on our lives because that fake news, if we follow it, keeps us away from the gospel of Jesus Christ that we so desperately need. So the bottom line is that we all sin. We're all disobedient. We all live in rebellion against God. Hitler was, was uh, not the line that we have to, that we have to uh, worry about. Jesus is the line that we have to think about. Uh, and unless we're as sinless as he was, then... We have sin. Our sin needs to be dealt with because we are disobedient. We are not like Jesus. And then thirdly, deserving of wrath, verse 3. If nothing else happens, God will deal with our sin in his wrath and in his justice. And he'll be fully justified in doing so because of our rebellion. I often ask people if they, they deserve anything from God, and their answer is always, no, we don't deserve anything from God. He doesn't owe us anything. But Paul tells us here, and the rest of the scripture says something much different. It says that, that sin leaves us deserving of God's wrath. We do deserve something. We do earn something. In our sin and rebellion, we earn God's wrath. He's going to deal with our sin. He's going to judge it um, justly. And so our sin is earned punishment from God. Uh, we also, in, this, in the, these first three verses, again, this is a little bit of a review, but uh, our enemy is defined here. And it's a triune enemy, uh, the threefold, if you use that word, uh, in, of our spiritual warfare. It has the world, the ways of the world he talks about. And the cultures that develop out of the ways of the world, they're always pushing us to conform uh, and to follow along with the attitudes and the values that it holds, always moving us away from God. Uh, uh, the devil, Satan, is listed here, uh, is not omnipresent. He's, he's limited by time and by space. He can't be everywhere at once, which we're thankful about. Uh, but he always is working through the world system 
uh, um, to blind us, to influence us, uh, to follow the world. Jesus called him a liar and a murderer uh, uh, from the beginning, and he lies and he, he murders as well. And we see that in our culture today. And then the third one is the flesh. The flesh refers to the moral fabric of our being, our, our, our thinking, our desires, our uh, 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 a will um, to choose, make choices in our lives. It leads us to sin because sin is our nature. We're born with that sin nature. We're not basically good. We're actually basically evil, the scripture tells us. And, and uh, our own flesh, our own hearts are our own enemy. Now, if the passage ended there, we would be in trouble. Uh, sin, we, in our sin, we would be lost, we'd be hopeless, we'd be dead um, if it ended there. Thankfully, it doesn't. It goes on into verse 4 um, with the next word, and I love this word in the scripture. Uh, it's, it, it, it helps us so much. But, the word but there. So you are dead in your sins, but God did something, and he did something amazing. And up to this point in the passage, we're the focus. But Paul here shifts it. He uses the but here to make a transition in the, in the language, uh, in the letter. And so he takes us out of that spot, of uh, the spotlight, and he puts God front and center right in the middle of the spotlight. Uh, and he breaks into our reality with extreme generosity, all based on th solid theology as he walks through this. Um, and so verse 4 talks about God's great love. Love is defined in 1 John 3.16 as Jesus' actions. Jesus laid down his life for us. We define love around here at Community Bible Chapel as doing what's best for the other person, no matter the cost to me, that comes right out of 1 John 3.16. Um, and so God has loved us in that even though we deserved his wrath, even though we've earned his wrath, he took the punishment that you and I deserve for our sin, and he paid it. What a generous God that we have. Uh, a loving God. And so God's, uh, God's generous love then is manifest really in two ways that Paul brings up here uh, and to bring us forgiveness for our sin. The first is mercy in verse 4. Mercy is not getting what we deserve. Um, we deserve punishment and we deserve uh, 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 for our sin. But God has withheld that punishment from us. In his mercy, he has not punished us for our sin. Now, God's character in his justice presents him, prevents him from just overlooking our sin or shoveling it under the rug. Or rug. He can't do that because of his justice. And his just nature demands that sin be paid for, as the wages of sin is death, as he said already in Romans. So, in a progressive revelation in the scripture, the Old Testament puts God's justice more in front than his mercy or his love. Uh, um, uh, and so that we see that, God, that sin must be paid for. We see that as you read through the Old Testament. You see the wages of sin is death. And you see that over and over and over again all through the Old Testament. But as we continue in God's, God's continuing revelation into the New Testament, with his, we see this amazing twist of God, God not just punishing sin, but taking the punishment himself. Which is just incredible. That's the extent of his love. So God's mercy then means that he withdrew his wrath that you and I deserve for our sin. And then in grace, in verse 5, grace is not, not like mercy, which is not getting what we do deserve. Grace is getting something that we don't deserve. Uh, unmerited favor. And so on top of not getting the punishment we deserve, God gives us forgiveness for our sin, and he gives us the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's our justification when we come to him in faith. And so that forgiveness of sin is something that, that uh, um, uh, or isn't something that we earn because we would think about it, our good outweighing our bad, and God's going to agree on a curve, and so I'm going to be okay. No, forgiveness isn't something that we earn in any sense, but it's a 100% free gift from God. Totally undeserved. And so grace is so important there that Paul mentions it three times in just these few verses uh, in this passage. Um, and the point is, we have a, an extremely generous God who has loved us with his mercy and with his grace. Uh, and then Paul goes on from there then, and he talks about the, the results, the God, the, 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 how God's generosity results in making all things new for us. 
tells us in verse 5 that we are made alive with Christ. We were dead in our transgressions, verses 1 to 3. Now he tells us we're made alive in Christ. That resurrection power to raise the dead, raise our dead souls, and to make us alive with Christ. And so rather than believe, uh, breathing the polluted air of, our, of death... Um, and I think about that. I don't know why this popped into my mind. Uh, sometimes we'll go on a trip and we'll swing into a fast food trip, a fast food uh, restaurant on our way. Uh, I'm not mentioning any names of what those might be. Uh, and we eat the food and whatever, and then we get out of the car, you know, 100 miles later and go to the bathroom. We come back into the car, and the car reeks of fast food restaurant. You know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, I think you do. Um, anyway, that, that's sort of what that's like, that breathing, that polluted air. It's like, wow, we've been, we've been sitting in the car smelling that for 100 miles. But now in Christ, we're made alive in Christ. We, we, we are now breathing the fresh, pure air of new life for the very first time. And what a blessing that is. Um, secondly, he raised us up with Christ in verse 6. Uh, this, is, this is part of the not yet reality of our, of our faith. Um, where God has raised us up with him. Our sin, has, our sin constantly is pushing us down. The world is constantly pushing us down. Satan is constantly reminding us that we're not good enough. But we've been raised with Christ, exalted with him. Think about that. God who is, who is exalted exalts us. That's amazing to me. And so we might strive for a place of prominence in the world, to climb the corporate ladder, try to be on, ahead of everybody else, but to be exalted by God, there's nothing that compares to that. And to give us a place then of, of highest status, a truth that we must remember is the world laughs at us and persecutes us. We, we remember, yes, Christ has raised us up. And then we're seated with Christ in verse 6. Uh, when Jesus ascended up to heaven, uh, he was seated at the right hand of God. His work was done. As he was seated, the work of salvation was finished. And as he was seated and as we are in him, our work of salvation is finished as well. In fact, it's a work that was impossible for us. We were unable to do it. <coughs> and so we are seated with Christ, Paul tells us. Then he goes on and speaks of the, the purpose, really, of God's generosity in verses 7 to 9. You know, we might think that, that, well, of course, God's generosity is for us because we're deserving. We're such good people that he, he is generous to us. Uh, and totally missed the point, but that's what we think oftentimes. Um, but that's not what Paul even says here. Um, under the direction of the Holy Spirit, as Paul is writing here, he says God has done all this in order that... Uh, his incomparable riches of his grace would be shown. Now, we're the recipients of that generosity, certainly. But the purpose is that God would reveal himself to the world, his generosity to the world. You know, we come up with all kinds of ideas about what God is like, but the scripture always cleans up our false uh, wrong thinking uh, and gets, it gives us a true picture of who God is. And he is a generous God. And you and I uh, get to live in, I think, the most amazing time of all of history. Uh, Paul talks about here in the coming ages uh, uh, that God's incomparable grace would be uh, revealed or be shown. So we get to live in this time between Paul's writing and the time as we wait Jesus' Jesus's return, which could be today. Uh, we don't know when that's going to be. It could be any time. We've been waiting for it, and it could be today. Um, but that's the time that we get to live in. It's an exciting time. It's a time of grace, incomparable grace. And so we get to live in, in the time of the revelation of God's incomparable grace. And so today is a day of salvation that we get to live in. Thankfully, because you and I then have that opportunity to come to Christ and place our trust in him, which is really the purpose of God's generosity, to reveal himself to, and, and all of his character to us so that we might be overwhelmed by his great love, his great mercy, his great grace, and the rest of all his character that make him who he is, and to put our trust in him because of who he is. Now, I need to pause just for a minute uh, and ask you, have you trusted in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sin? If you haven't done that, I would encourage you, I would beseech you, I would beg you uh, to do that. Trust in him. Admit your sin. Agree with what the scripture says. We were all condemned. We were all uh, <coughs> um, uh, in sin. 
with all that we talked about already in verses 1 to 3. But now, when we place our trust in Jesus, we have all the blessing of God because of his great love for us. Trust in him. Admit your sin before him and believe that he came and died for us on the cross, paying for our sin, paying completely for our sin, fully paid for. What a blessing that is. If, you, if, if that's the first time you've made that prayer today, I would encourage you to give me a call, email me something. Uh, I would love to pray for you and talk with you about that. Paul goes on here in verse 8, and he sums up really our salvation. For it is by grace that you are saved, through faith, and it is not, a, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Now, we're not saved by doing good deeds or by uh, not doing bad deeds. That's not what saves us. God saves us through his grace or by his grace. And so that means that our salvation is completely apart from anything that you and I might do. He does all the work of salvation. He dies for our sin. He rose from the dead by resurrection power. He places us in his family. He, and he transforms us a little bit more into the image of his son, Jesus Christ, every day. So the riches of God's incomparable grace are poured out or lavished upon us, uh, all those who trust in him, uh, um, for all to see. Because your life is now different because you trusted in Jesus Christ. Because he has brought you into his family. We've done nothing to earn it, but he makes all things new in our lives. Now Paul concludes this here with, with uh, the battle really suiting up for battle for us. Uh, in verse 10, he speaks of created for good works. Now we have to consider how, how this prepares us for spiritual warfare uh, and consider really... <clears throat> the good works that God has prepared for us to do. First, we always need to have the order right. We're never working to earn our salvation, working to pay back for our salvation or anything like that, because then grace would not be grace. It would be uh, something that we would earn. Uh, and grace is unmerited favor. It's, it's some, receiving something that we did not earn. And so what are these works that he's talking about? Uh, um, uh, we always have to have the order right. So we're working not to earn our salvation, but we're working because we already have God's salvation. That he's already blessed us with and given uh, to us. You know, we used to work and earn, uh, attempt anyway, to earn our salvation through the spirit, really, of our enemy who was lying to us um, and would remind us either of how good we were. Wow, look at that work that you just did. You just helped that old lady across the street. You're an awesome person. You know, you don't even need God's forgiveness that you're so good. Or he reminds us of how bad we are. You know, oh. You, you really missed that opportunity. You just tripped that old lady walking across the street, and, and now you're in big trouble. God would never forgive you of that sin. Both of those things leave us trusting in ourselves to earn our salvation in some form, <coughs> even though they're total opposites, uh, um, uh, and, and, and both a lie, a lie from the pit of hell, from Satan himself, and both of us leaving trusting in ourselves rather than trusting in a generous God of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But now God accepts us, he forgives us in Christ, and the Holy Spirit now indwells us and empowers us to live for God's glory, to accomplish the things that he has for us to do. God makes all things new. Two types of works that are, that are mentioned here. The first is that we are God's handiwork. God is working in us. Okay, this speaks of, of that, that idea that he's working in us, he's changing us, he's making us more like his son, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and so all through the New Testament, we see this call for our sanctification, which is the not yet part of our salvation. Uh, um, that's, that's a lifetime discipleship process. It's all about spiritual warfare. It's about making the moral choices, about who we worship. It's about getting coming alongside others and helping them. So that's what it's about. That's spiritual warfare. Uh, and as we grow to be the follower of Jesus Christ that he's called us to be, where, where uh, the God of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ becomes front and center in all of that we think, all that we say, all that we do, it all focuses in on him. And we tend to fade then into the background of that, uh, all for his glory. Where God works in us, to help us to grow, uh, to put off our sin. We're going to look at this later on in Ephesians 4. But to put off our sin, to renew our minds, and then to put on his righteousness. So that's spiritual warfare. 
<coughs> as we battle our sinful desires to follow Jesus. Uh, you know, our resource center, um, which is open to you, if you want to come in and, and browse through there and pick up some books, is, is packed, jam-packed full of resources, books, booklets, uh, all kinds of things to help us uh, understand that process uh, of changing and growing and becoming more like Christ, of God's work in us. Uh, it's, it's all about it. And there, there's general ones in there, and there's specific ones in there. General on how, to, how changing and growing happens, and then there's specific ones on, uh, on a worry or a anxiety or stress or sexual issues or whatever it might be. There's, there's this jam pack with all kinds of resources to help us to join God in his work of restoring our hearts. And then the second work that, that God has for us is the good works, to work through us. So not only is he working in our hearts, but he's also working through our hearts to work out into the community, out into the world. All things are new, and all things are now different. We have a new purpose. We have uh, this new purpose of living for God's glory rather than for our own glory. We have a new hope, the un and the, the new hope is in the unchanging character of who God is rather than in the ever-changing circumstances of our lives. Um, and then we also have a new work that's based on showing the incomparable riches of his grace to the world around us. You know, God is not surprised by the coronavirus. That didn't, he's not surprised by it at all. Uh, and he continues, even in the midst of it, to reveal his glorious grace, his incomparable riches of his grace, every single day. Um, now, as a church, we're not meeting together. We're not here together in the church building on Sunday morning. But the church is not a building that we meet in. It's a people. It's his people. It's God's people. Whether we meet together or whether we don't meet together, I'm filled with hope because of the church of the living God and how he works through his church and in his church to reveal his incomparable riches. I'm stoked. You know, I'm stoked when I, when I look at the body, when I look around, when I call people during the week and see how we're doing, to see how you're reaching out to one another, how you're calling one another, how you're sending notes to one another, uh, encouraging notes, uh, um, uh, all of that, revealing God's incomparable riches to one another. Some of you are baking cookies for those that work in the hospital. Some are making masks. Joining God in his works to reveal his incomparable grace to the community. Uh, many of you are caring for one another in life groups or outside of life groups, getting together uh, over the phone or by Zoom or whatever it might be, uh, revealing God's incomparable grace to those around it, to one another. I I'm looking forward to the day uh, shortly, I'm hoping, praying, that we can open, uh, things will be open enough for us to resume the built ministry. Where I, I know Josh, I talked to him recently. He has four different projects that we have on our on a slate. There's a couple roofs, there's a couple other different projects for people that are struggling in their homes. They don't have the funds or the finances to to fix them, uh, um, or they're elderly or whatever it is their situation. <coughs> and those are going to be starting soon. Where we're helping people in the challenges of life to reveal God's incomparable grace. Uh, I had opportunity to speak uh, uh, with our, some of our local uh, um, uh, elected officials recently, and I've been uh, excited by some of the opportunities that might be coming along in terms of that, in terms of how we as a church might be able to help our community so that we might join God in his work through us to show his incomparable riches of his grace. I'm excited those who have come forward to help counsel other people, uh, using their gifts for God's glory and again to reveal his incomparable grace, because it's that that changes people. So yes, we're adjusting to the new normal of doing church in a new and different way, and it's not going to end any time real soon. It's not going to be two weeks. We're going to be gathered all together, and everything's going to be normal. Things are not going to be normal. They're going to be different for quite a long time. We're not going to be gathering together as a full church, and so we're going to be doing things differently. We're going to be ministering God's grace in a different way than we have in the past. And I'm excited by that, because God, God hasn't stopped ministering the incomparable riches of his grace. He continues continues to even in the midst of this coronavirus shutdown they haven't shut him down one bit nor is he hindered by it nor is God's church hindered by it yes we're scrambling to try to figure out exactly how to minister because things are different we're 
trying to figure out how to do that. And we're in the midst of that. Um, and as we do that, however, we have this great opportunity of showing his incomparable riches of his grace to other people, to a lost community all around us. So help us in that. Um, you know, God has not suddenly become unsovereign or hindered by any of this. And his church is also not hindered by any of this. Yes, we're doing things different. Yes, it's a difficulty because it's different for us. But it hasn't changed what we do. It hasn't changed our core uh, um, uh, 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 ministry or mission of what we're about, bringing his glory for all the world to see. And so he's continuing to work both in us and through us to those around us, whether we meet on Sunday or whether we don't meet on Sunday. Because all things are new. We have new opportunities to show God's generous nature to all those around us, the incomparable riches of, the, of his grace, all for his glory and honor. <laughs> what a great time it is to be alive. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful. We praise you for your goodness to us. We thank you for this letter that Paul wrote to the, the church in Ephesus and wrote to us down through the ages, um, as he spoke of in, even in this chapter. And Father, we have a great purpose that you've called us to, this purpose of showing your incomparable riches of your grace to the world around us. Father, as you work in us and through us, as you change us uh, and work to meet needs through us, Father, what a blessing that is. What a joy it is, Father, to be active, to be uh, working, coming alongside of you and your work, ultimately, uh, of showing your grace to the world so that they might come to respond and respond to your generous gospel uh, of Jesus Christ, that we can place our faith in you and that you took the punishment for our sin. And through that faith, Father, your grace has already been given to us in him. Uh, um, and, and our sin is forgiven. That is, that is the most generous gift that we could even imagine. And it makes all things new. And so, Father, we're thankful. We praise you, Lord, for this day in which we live in, this day in which we're stuck at home. I'll use that term, but not really stuck at home. There's tremendous things for us to do. Some of those are in, in us, and some of those are through us. And so, Father, we're grateful. Help us open our eyes to the opportunities that abound around us to reveal the incomparable grace of who you are. Father, we thank you and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great week and be about the purpose of which God has called us to, the sharing and the showing of his incomparable grace. Have a great week.